Happy New Year, CyberWire listeners. Rick Howard here. Now that we're in 2023, we're so excited to bring you more ways to stay ahead in the industry with one of the leaders in cybersecurity training and our newest best friend, CyberVista. As a thank you to our listeners, we would like to offer you a free CyberVista practice test as well as three free months of CyberWire Pro. Three free months and a practice test? That's a great deal. Visit thecyberwire.com slash promo. That's the cyberwire.com slash promo and use the code ProLearn, all one word. That's P R O L E A R N to redeem this limited time offer. Many organizations, they try to do uh, a combination of both technical security controls, for example, um, spam filtering, uh, areas like that, as well as they try to do training. In many cases, they're not doing enough. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from Harbor Labs and the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, Chip Gibbons, who's CISO at Thrive Networks, joins us to talk about business email compromise. So who's got the advantage in cybersecurity, the attacker or the defender? Intelligent people differ on this, but the conventional wisdom is that the advantage goes to the attacker. But why is this? Stay with us and we'll have some insights from our sponsor, Know Before, that put it into perspective. All right, Joe, uh, we are going to jump right into our stories this week. Ooh, and uh, <laughs> I have a story. This is uh, another one from uh, Rest of the World, which is a, sort of a, a global news uh, tech, tech news website. Hmm. Um, uh, this is my primary source, but I actually followed this story on a couple of different places. Uh, and this is about how Amazon has authorized sellers in Pakistan and... A wave of scammers followed that. Now, I was unaware that Amazon goes nation by nation and authorizes who can sell on their website. So, makes sense. I, let me understand this. Amazon has essentially opened up authorized selling in Pakistan. Correct. In other words, before that, if you were in Pakistan, you could not be an authorized seller. Correct. But once they flip the switch, yeah. I think you could buy other people's stuff. So, for example, the U.S. and China were both nations that were authorized to sell on Amazon globally. Right. right. But uh, Pakistan had not yet been authorized to do so. So Amazon uh, flipped that switch, and uh, lots of folks started selling on Amazon. And, of course, the vast majority of them are legitimate sellers. Sure. Uh, and this article talks about how it's really been a boon for a lot of people in Pakistan who, to have this opened up to them, uh, they can be entrepreneurs. Right. And they are. Uh, and there's a real um, market in people who are teaching other people how to do this, the best ways to optimize your goods and the things you sell and to, to create a, an online store. So in that way, it's been great. But of course, <laughs> we can't have nice things. Right. Uh, so... Uh, there's been a boom of scammers as well, uh, and for the legitimate sellers on Amazon uh, who are from Pakistan, they are concerned that Amazon could throw that switch back again, that they could uh, – that that some Pakistani IPs are being blacklisted hmm. uh, to sell on Amazon because of the the amount of scams that are happening here. This article says that – uh, back in May of last year, Amazon shut down about 13,000 Pakistani seller accounts that it suspected of fraud. Right. But what? why Why IP addresses? Uh, don't know. <clears throat> because if, if two – if you and I are on similar IP networks, yeah. right, or on the same IP – we might have at some network address translation point the same IP address. Yeah. If we both have the same provider – yeah. Yeah. I don't know. This article says uh, Pakistani IPs are blacklisted. So says Ayaz Ali, 
uh, a seller who clocks revenues uh, reaching 60,000 uh, British pounds uh, through last fall. He says you can create an account and instantly it's blocked or sometimes never approved. So I guess it's it's regional, sounds like to me. Like maybe they're using uh, you know geographic uh, mm. means to black IP addresses. Um, but what I really wanted to dig into were the actual scams that uh, they're using here. Yes, that's actually a... a- I'd like to hear about that. So uh, one of them is called the Kabutar trick. They said that's the most popular uh, Amazon sk- seller scam in Pakistan. Uh, and this is uh, the fake delivery scam, mm. right? So uh, the scammer puts something up for sale on Amazon. So you go ahead and buy this thing, and uh, the scam seller will ship you something uh-huh. so that there's a tracking number but it's not the thing that you bought. (laughs) Yep, we've seen this before. (laughs) Right, absolutely. He just goes out to his yard, picks up some piece of trash that's laying around. Right. Puts it into an envelope, mails it to you. Right, and so uh, you get that piece of trash in the mail, you complain to Amazon, and the seller says, no, no, we sent them the thing. Look, here's the tracking number. Right. And that's how it works. They profit and clean their yard. That's right. (laughs) Um. This article points out that these folks are using Facebook groups to uh, communicate with each other, the scammers. This is where they kind of teach each other, communicate, tell each other what works and what doesn't, Mm. uh, which is, I don't know, kind of interesting that there's multi-tiered, you know, online social media. I guess we shouldn't be surprised. (laughs) There's another big tech company involved in the malfeasance. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, surprise. (laughs) Right, right. And, of course, Facebook is like, ah, we don't condone the activity. I'm sure if you ask them about it, that's what they'll say. But Yeah, there was one that uh, this article, I didn't get a clear understanding of it on, so I tried to chase it down on another article. I want to see what you think about this, Joe. Um, So there is a scam that they use using Sam's Club. Now, Sam's Club is one of the membership discount clubs yeah, it's had, Sam Walton, the founder of, the, of Walmart, right. opened up a large, like, Costco mm-hmm. uh, when Costco and Price Club and Sam's Club were, and BJ's, I guess, were all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so you pay an annual membership fee and you get access to this warehouse kind of place you right. know, where you can buy stuff. And Wondrous. The, yes, it is. The joke is that it's the only place you can buy a, a six-pack of lawn tractors. Right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so the way that this scam works is that uh, a Pakistani seller would register a U.S. company and they would apply for a credit limit on Sam's Club, which this article says in some instances will allow a credit limit of up to $10,000 to shop. Really? Yeah. So the sellers then receive orders from customers on Amazon Marketplace. Then the scammer would use the credit card limit on the Sam's Club account to purchase and deliver the order to the customer. It says this allows scammers to receive payment from the customer, but then they claim a refund from Sam's Club. That's what I don't understand what's going on here. They claim a refund from Sam's Club? Yeah, so I, 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 tried to, I looked at another article about this to try to, to See, get— See, because where I thought this was going, Dave, was then they just shut down the company, don't pay the Sam's Club bill, and get 100% profit at the expense of Sam's Club. Yeah, so but, I, I found another article about this. Uh, this is from another local—another uh, um, this is a news organization that's local to Pakistan. And they refer to this as a filing scam— And I'll just read this. It says, filing is another smartly mischievous trick used by Amazon Pakistan sellers. The sellers on Amazon take orders from customers on their Amazon accounts. Rather than delivering the products from Amazon, they buy the products from other sites like Walmart, Sam's Club, and other vendors. Right. This way, sellers get the order on Amazon, buy from other vendors by making secondary accounts, and deliver it to the actual buyers. Thinking about where is the fraud— Yes, yes, yeah. we are, yes. Yeah, that, that, sounds like, that <laughs> well, sounds like business with extra steps, but go ahead. It, it goes on and says, Pakistan sellers are using the assistance of staff from Sam's Club to get a refund on the delivered goods. Sellers show that buyers did not get the product and demand a refund from secondary vendors. By using the filing technique, sellers get the actual payment from the customers as well as a refund from the vendors. I'm still not 100 percent clear. On okay, what's so going on in other here. words, do you, do you? in other words, is Sam's Club also having authorized resellers? Maybe that's what it is. That sounds like that because they're saying that Sam's Club employees are helping them yeah. get 
money back from other sellers. So I think what's happening is, all right, so I set up my fake store on Amazon, okay? And you see it and you say, hey, I want to buy one of those things. I want to buy that widget. And you buy it from me. And I send it to you directly, basically drop ship it to you from my Sam's Club account. Right. Where I have credit. Yes. Okay. Uh, It gets delivered to you. But then I guess with my cohort who works for Sam's Club, who's in on the, the scam, somehow we convince Sam's Club that the item did not get delivered. So we get payment from you because you're happy. You got the thing that you wanted. Right. So you pay for it. But then we get a refund from Sam's Club by somehow claiming that it never got delivered. That's the scam as I understand it. Okay. Yeah. Seems like a lot of steps, but... It it does. (laughs) And it seems like it's pretty easy to thwart, right? Yeah. By saying, well, I don't know. Maybe you could say something like, well, we're not going to refund the money because, frankly, you're a new customer. Could be. And we don't know if this is fraudulent or not. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. but, I mean, I don't know. This sound, This is very, very convoluted. It is, but I guess if you, if you rig up a system to yeah. sort of streamline it for yourself, it works, and it must be worth doing. Um, so, But why not just sell the stuff, take the profit? I mean, maybe they're not making a profit. Maybe that's what the issue is. Mm-hmm. Right. If you sell it at cost, and then right. what you're counting on is— Is getting the if, money back. Yeah. If you get the full price of the thing, that's better than any right. margin you would have gotten on yeah, it. Yeah, you can change the business model from zero profit to 100% profit. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, they list some of the some of the scams that are being done here, and they're the familiar ones. The one we already talked about, the, the pigeon trick, which is the, you know, the fake shipping thing. The filing one is the one we just talked about. They talk about carding. Uh, they talk about somehow they're doing sales tax fraud, and this is, again, by using um, American accounts. They can collect sales tax but then not have to pay the sales tax because they're not actually from America right, and they right. can't get tracked down. And yeah, blah, if you, you – know. uh, it's just a way – that would be just a way to increase your revenue. I yeah. mean, it's simple. You just have a table that says, where am I shipping this? and or Or pretend that you're in – a state and just add a tax line that you don't ever pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's easy to understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That one I get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, interesting. And again, you know, the folks who are doing legitimate business here, their concern is that, uh, Amazon might say, this is not worth our trouble and just shut it down. That, I suspect that probably isn't going to happen. I, I would think not because if, there's a lot of people doing legitimate business on here. It's worth Amazon's time. Yeah, that's they get what a I cut think. of every one of these little deals. Right, uh, right. And, and that's they, that's what lets Jeff Bezos fly rockets in his space. <laughs> they they must have known too going into this market. They they had some idea right. what they were going to expect in terms of that initial surge of scam, and the, and I'm sure they'll try to tamp down on it. But you know, we all know. I, I mean, Amazon certainly turns a blind eye to a lot of stuff that goes on on their platform. That, uh, counterfeiting and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They are not strict at all when it comes to a lot of this. So, but you're right. Jeff Bezos gets to fly his rocket. So, right. <laughs> all right, that's my story this week. What do you have for us, Joe? Dave, my story comes from Drew F. Lawrence over at Military.com, hmm. and um, there's a scam going on right now that is targeting new members of the military, hmm. and these. Scams have been po- – people have posted warnings from these scams at Fort Benning, Wachuca, and West Point, which is which kind of all over the map. That runs the spectrum it of – uh, Yeah. And also all over – you know, uh, West Point is a uh, an officer cadet school. Right. And the other two are – I guess they have basic training at those two places. Mm-hmm. Uh, The alerts outline a scam in which unknown individuals purporting to be a non-commissioned officer are calling soldiers and asking them for money to fix a, quote, pay problem. Hmm. Now, if there are any questions that the soldier or trainee or recruit or whatever they call themselves uh, at at that point have, then the the person on the other uh, on the other end goes full R. Lee Ermy on them, <laughs> right? And what are you, a maggot? Ah, starts yelling at them, right? Yeah, I don't do yeah. a good R. Lee Ermy. Pulling impression. rank. Pulling rank, uh-huh. threatening punishment. 
So far, 74 soldiers have been scammed out of $143,000. Wow. So the Facebook post from Wachuca, which came out just before the end of the new year or end of the end of last year. It, yeah. We're new year. See you next year, Dave. <laughs> I, I, I hate those guys. Um, says that the base's military uh, police have identified a scam uh, at multiple duty stations throughout the army within the uniformed service. And I think this is interesting because it seems to me that someone has information that they shouldn't have access to. Hmm. Somewhere there's, there's somebody getting access to these, uh, these new recruits because they're really taking advantage of their ignorance of the situation and their unfamiliarity, their lack of fami- lack of familiarity with the, with the, uh, with the process for things like getting a call out of the blue from an NCO. Uh, you know, there, there's things that they teach you in these courses, according to I've never served, but I know people who have, they say one of the things in basic training is on the wall, there is a, a chain of command that is hung up on the wall that starts with the drill instructor or drill sergeant and goes all the way up to the president, the commander in chief. Mm. And it, it tells you the names of everybody up there. Right. And you are within your rights to question anybody outside of that chain of command. So, but maybe you didn't have that day at basic training yet. I, I, you know, I, like I say, I don't know how, how this works exactly. Yeah. I could imagine though, being a new recruit, you're, you're going to be on your best behavior and perhaps right. a little intimidated by this whole process. Yeah. Of, and, you know, and most of us haven't grown up in that sort of an environment where and, someone has absolute, uh, authority over and you. And that environment is very disorienting yeah. to begin with, mm-hmm. uh, because you're in, they, they're in the process of essentially remaking you. Right, they're they're mm. taking you and they're going to train you into into being what they need you to be, uh, which is a soldier or a, a, in, the, in the case of the army, a soldier. Yeah. Um, but the um, here's what happens on the call: the caller tells the soldier that they are from the DFAS or the Defense Finance Accounting Service, which is a real accounting service. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's involved in the paying of soldiers. It probably is, but. Mm. Uh, it, it's, they say there's a problem with the soldier's military pay, and then they um, they tell the soldier that to correct the issue and get the appropriate amount of payback, the soldier has to send money to the caller via a third-party peer-to-peer money app like uh, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, Zelle, or Apple Pay. Ah. Right? Raise the red flag. <laughs> yes. So, but the key aspect of this uh, of the entire scam is they're using the fear to get somebody to do what they want. Right. Uh, and you know, I don't know how you protect against this aside from what the army here is doing. And that is they're telling everybody about this. This is a scam. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the great things about being in the army, it, uh, about the army is that the communication system, if you need to, if you need to get a communication system down to recruits, you can quickly do that, mm. uh, by just having, you know, having that, said at whatever uh, morning meeting everybody has where they have to go out and stand in formation. I don't know what that's called. Like I said, I've never served, Dave. Um, <laughs> and I'm grateful to all who have <laughs> to allow me that luxury. But, uh, you know, what, you know it, there, is, there is a way to not people know about this and to tell them that this scam is coming, and, and they're doing that. Mm-hmm. But they should also, you know, they, they should be making this, you know, they should be making this uh, announcement throughout the Army, and everybody should be talking about it. It's one of the ways you get rid of these kind of scams is by talking about it. The other way is by putting these people behind bars. Yeah, I, I, I and to your original point, I, I wonder how they are targeting these folks. Yeah, I was thinking that would be an. How are they getting their contact information? Yeah, I'd like is to that, know that. To what degree is that public information? I mean, I can see that uh, back in the days when we had local newspapers, you know, you could say, "And congratulations to Bob Smith, who's." Family is so proud of him. He's heading off to basic training to serve our country. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, you, those announcements existed. Yeah. Are these, I, it doesn't really say uh, if these people, maybe these people are posting on Facebook saying, yeah, hey, right. uh, shipping off to the army today. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Some scammer writes that down and calls you a week later with your pay problem, you know, alleged pay problem and tries to scare you into sending them some money via Venmo. Yeah. I mean, I, I, just, I, I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is there's, is there some more efficient public list of new recruits? Is that, is there some database somewhere that is publicly accessible, 
you know, that we don't, you and I just don't know about. Right. But yeah. that it's because for some reason, you know, kind of like, you know, if you buy or sell your house, it's on the public record. Right. If you join the military, is that on the public record? It I don't might know the answer. I don't it, know the answer. It to might that. very well be. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, I hope they find these people because uh, that's a, you know, and it's not like, it's not like our soldiers, particularly uh, folks who are just starting out their careers in the military. These are not people who are rolling in dough. No, you know? <laughs> no, they're 18 year old kids. Usually. Right, right, right. Sometimes I mean, suppose they could get signing bonuses or things like that, but, uh, well, that's you know, what these scammers are after. Right, right. Absolutely. All right. Well, that is uh, from military.com, and we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider on the show, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. All right, Joe, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Manny. It's uh, an email from Manny, but it's not about an email. It's about one of those website tricks. Hmm. So why don't you read what Manny wrote, and I'll comment on the way. Okay. It says, hi, Dave and Joe. I may be wrong about this one, but it smells funny. I recently came across an ad on a web page where I wanted to download an HDRI, high dynamic range image, for a 3D project. As you do, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the ad appeared in the area where you could expect to find a download button. Now, stop right there. Okay. I hate this. Oh, I, go, okay. I hate this so much. This happens on so many websites where you go to get some kind of software or some kind of library, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is, something you need to, to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, SourceForge, I think, does this. Yeah. Where you go there and it, it says, download here. It's a big green button, right? Uh -huh. And it and you click on it and that's an ad. That's not, the download link is actually a link. It's not, it's a little blue link that you have to click on to get the software. Huh. But there's a big ad that looks like a download button. So it's a misdirection? It's a misdirection. It's deception? Yep. And these sites do do this on purpose. Yeah. So, okay. It's part of their business model. All right. Because they get click throughs on it. <laughs> Manny goes on and says, when I absent mindedly clicked the ad, which just says download here, mm -hmm. it promptly proceeded to ask me for my cell phone number to verify that I am human. Mm -hmm. This See, gave me pause. That would, that would stop the transaction right there. Mm -hmm. I, I would immediately have pause here as well. So I went back to the tab of the original page and clicked the little I that Google puts on its ads to get some more info. I reported this ad as a possible fish, mm -hmm. but then I decided to Google the company listed as the advertiser. Uh, I'm not going to name the company here. Um, the company, according to LinkedIn, is an emerging leader in premium content delivery, digital marketing, direct carrier billing, and microservices. Its primary strategy is to build a large social online community through globally known services and independent, culturally specific, localized store. Mm. The direct carrier billing part really caught my eye. This, is, this is Manny too. again. Yep. Could the end game here be to actually steal directly via carrier billing or just use that as a jumping off point to carry the scam further? Sure, sir. We'll help you get that refund. Just help us install our rat on your side. <laughs> right. I don't know that it goes that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I like the way Manny's thinking. Right, yeah. yeah. It could. Manny says, I suspect that the scammers, if scammers at all, are not the website owners, but someone who's just using them as tools. Mm. I'm not set up to investigate this type of thing, but I thought you might find this interesting. Well, let's let me do some wild speculation here. Okay. Uh, first off, uh, we're not going to name the company because the company may actually be a legitimate business mm -hmm. doing something, but that does have the word offshore in their name. <laughs> so I'm going to point that out. Okay. Uh, I want to commend Manny here because the one thing, this entire statement that they make, uh, it's an emerging market leader in premium content delivery, digital marketing, direct carrier billing, and microservices, and then goes on to talk about how trying to commit. That's all BS. The only thing that matters there is direct carrier billing, mm. right? They're going to bill the carrier for a service. That's why they want your cell phone when you click on it. Mm. You're, you're just signing up for some uh, some cell phone service. That they're going to bill your carrier. Maybe it's a small amount every month. Mm -hmm. And But if I can bill you for 50 cents a month through your carrier, you may never even notice that. When was the last time you looked at your mobile bill, Dave? <laughs> 
I was just thinking, I haven't uh, looked at my mobile bill in a long time. It's not yeah. that far out of whack. Yeah. It, it, I, I see how much they charge me every month on the credit card, mm -hmm. and I go, that looks right, and I move on. Mm -hmm. I think that's what this is, is they're just trying to get you, because I think in that, and after you enter your phone number, there's a little, little thing that says, that a checkbox that says, I agree, already checked, and all you have to do is click submit, and then you sign up for some service that uh, either annoys you or just bills you quietly for the next eon. Yeah. I, I is, Can we move up to the high level, though, here, that, that we should be uh, skeptical of these types of websites at all? I mean, we've all seen these. You, yeah. you, go, you go on the web and you want something for free. Right. You know, right. and in this case, it's an image. Right. Or, and uh, and, and I think we've all been there. It's software. Right. And so you go, but I've certainly seen, you know, back in the golden age of shareware, you know, you would have sites just like this where you want to get something for free, but until, but, you know, they'll make you jump through hoops to try to get it. And, and that's just seems to me like that's what this is. Um, would Manny be better off finding a place that wanted to sell him this image for a small fee rather than risk whatever is happening on this particular site potentially um i don't know i i you know what i just went to sourceforge and looked this up i'm sorry it was not sourceforge sourceforge actually the big green download button is a big green download button mm -hmm. <laughs> but it it's another site i can't remember what it is uh but it was it was uh it was a similar sourceforge actually does it right so i'm sorry sourceforge that was incorrect mm. um i don't know uh i go i i will use these sites yeah, for an HDRI file, that's probably a uh, a data file. So I don't know that there's anything malicious in it unless there's a vulnerability in your software that you're going to open it with that can be exploited that way, which we've seen those kind of things before. Um, so yeah. be mindful of that. The very first thing I do with everything I download from one of these sites is put it right in virus total, see what happens. Hmm. Put it in, uh, Even if it's a data file, I've, I've done that. It, it comes back and goes, oh, we didn't find anything, but... Uh, especially if you're going to be downloading uh, applications or or libraries, yeah, uh, that are freely available on there. Uh, like for example, there's a, there's an MP3 conversion library that that used to have to be it couldn't it couldn't be distributed for uh, for profit or something like that. So all these uh, converters you told you to go out and download the MP3 file. Sure, yeah, I remember that. Sure, uh, the MP3 DLL. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd go out and do that. And but every single time I'd scan that thing with a virus scanner before I ran it, mm -hmm. before I installed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. I, I guess it's worth mentioning or reiterating that, uh, particularly when it comes to these days, right. particularly when it comes to downloading software, and by software I mean pirated software, right? And also movies. Yeah. That odds are. They are dirty, dirty, dirty. Right. right. But this probably isn't a pirated software thing. This no, is, no. This no. is probably just a, a, an image that's available on some 3D sharing site. Right. That uh, the, the company's business model is we're a platform for sharing these kind of 3D images. Mm -hmm. People upload them. It's a community. But the, they have to profit somehow, so they profit with these ads. Yeah. And these ads are just terrible. They shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> right. It's the, it's the most annoying way to profit there it, is. It is. It is. <laughs> All right. Well, our thanks to Manny for sending that in. We do appreciate it. And again, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. Now let's return to our sponsor's question about the attacker's advantage. Why do the experts think this is so? It's not like a military operation where the defender is thought to have most of the advantages. In cyberspace, the attacker can just keep trying and probing at low risk and low cost, and the attacker only has to be successful once. And as No Before points out, email filters designed to keep malicious spam out have a failure rate of over 10%. That sounds pretty good. Who wouldn't want to bat nearly 900? But this isn't baseball. If your technical defenses fail in one out of 10 tries, you're out of luck and maybe out of business. The last line of defense is your human firewall. You can test that firewall with No Before's free phishing test, which you can order up at nobefore.com slash fishtest. 
That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com, slash fish test. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Chip Gibbons. He is the CISO at a company called Thrive Networks. And our conversation centered around business email compromise. Here's my conversation with Chip Gibbons. What we've noticed is business email compromise is growing exponentially every year. It's one of the fastest growing areas of compromise within a business, also the most common area of compromise within a business. It is easy for an attacker to get into a network via email or in some cases, you know, smishing or SMS phishing. It's an easy way to bypass a lot of the controls that IT security has in place now. And how are organizations responding to this or, or what sort of things are they putting in place? Many organizations, they try to do uh, a combination of both technical security controls, for example, um, spam filtering, uh, areas like that, as well as they try to do training. In many cases, they're, they're not doing enough. For example, for, for training, I think a lot of people, uh, they're used to a 45-minute, once-a-year annual training on what not to click for an email. That mm. is not enough, in, in reality, almost too long, because people just can't focus on security awareness training for 45 minutes without you know, their, their mind wandering. So what we have found is almost short, quick monthly trainings give a little bit more to the to the end user so they, they can take something back without, you know, zoning out for, for, for 45 minutes. Well, how do you balance that out? I mean, you, obviously you want to get your employees up to speed and give them a good overview of what's expected of them. But as you say, you also don't want to hit them with an avalanche of information. How do you dial it in? That's where it starts getting a little tricky. But if you focus on specific attacks and how they're accomplished, it actually can really bring or draw the, the end user into you know, w- what they should be looking for. For example, if, if you start talking about W2 attacks and how that can affect them in, 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 in real life, people are more apt to, to, to listen to it and follow along. If you're combining W2 attacks with SMS attacks, with some other type of attack, it's too much. So if you break it down into bite-sized chunks that are maybe five, seven minutes long, uh, once a month, uh, it's it's not as much of a hit on the business over you know over a year. It's only five, seven minutes every month. Most people can take that. You know, it's it's not a, a long period of time, but they get a lot of detail in those five, seven minutes. You mentioned a W two attack. Can you? Describe for us what exactly that is and, and maybe some of the other uh, common attacks that you and your colleagues track. Yeah, so uh, so a W-2 attack, so what can happen is an executive or somebody else within the company or, or maybe even looks like you will contact HR trying to change where your, your salary is going, you know, your bank routing numbers, whatnot. A W-2 attack can also be utilized as a way to put in false tax returns as you, so they can get, you know, t- uh, uh, an attacker get can get money back from the government, but it's really not you. Those areas where, you know, people don't really think about it as an attack mechanism. What we're seeing is anywhere there's money involved in any type of the organization, be it salaries, be it W-2 tax forms, or even vendor accounts, that's a big area for, for, um, for an area for an attack. For example, like a vendor account compromiser are very common these days. Where what you do is an attacker will get into a, a vendor's email system. They send you new routing codes that you need to, you know, pay the bill with a with a new routing number or, or whatnot. It's an easy way to have you start sending money to the wrong place, and the vendors doesn't know the difference. They might not notice for a month that suddenly you're not paying them, but you think you've been paying them all along. What are some routines that organizations can put in place to try to protect themselves against these sorts of things? So one of the things we always recommend is if you're if you ever see something in an email or, or other type of you know communication mechanism, SMS or whatnot, that is a change to what is normally happening. So a, a change to the routing number, 
a change to where you're sending money, always follow up with a phone call or a dis different communication mechanism. So if you're, for example, if you're internally you use Teams and somebody contacts you, your CEO contacts you via email, follow up with Teams or follow up with a phone call asking, did they actually ask for this change? Because if you follow up with the same communication mechanism, it could be that, you know, that, that email has been compromised and you're just now communicating via the, the attacker, which is not going to give you obviously the right information. How much of this involves, you know, the, the organizations that, that you engage with for your, your, ser the services that your employees use? I'm thinking about the basics, you know, things like email, endpoint protection, those sorts of things. I guess where I'm coming from is it strikes me that, you know, sort of daily run of the mill spam is mostly a solved problem that we rely on our email providers to do a good job with. And it seems like they do. To what degree are, are they able to protect us from some of these more sophisticated things? Right. So I think some of the, the, the standard spam filtering techniques, they do remove a good portion of this, these attacks. But then you have better attackers that really understand how email flows, how these spam filters work, they're able to bypass it. And you know, that is, they see it as that their job, that is what they're doing to make money to, to bypass these spam filters and get into other accounts. Now, there have been much better type heuristic filters out there that some, some companies are starting to put in place. So for example, if you, Dave, and I have never contacted before, and suddenly you're, you're emailing me out of the blue to, to change a grounding number or, or, or do something, that would be abnormal and it might put you, you know, either put you in a quarantine section or it might put a, a big red banner out on the email saying you've never contacted this person before. Mm -hmm. But if you've contacted other people within my organization before and it's the first time you're contacting me, that wouldn't be as abnormal. So there are some companies out there that are, are really focusing on the heuristics of how, how uh, email has been flowing within the organization into what domains they've been flowing to. And suppose that, that you've either been compromised or maybe you suspect that you've been compromised. What should you do then? What kind of steps should you take? So one of the things that we recommend is if if you believe you've been compromised, obviously you want to bring in an, an outside provider. If you don't have in, inside staff to be able to dig in and do the, the, the forensics on this, but you want to find out truly what the attackers got into and what, what they might have seen or, or you have a good confidence level that you have been attacked and, and some data has been exfiltrated, you absolutely want to, uh, to notify the authorities as well as the people who, whose data might have been compromised. It used to be you know, uh, years ago that it was, it was, it was a, a badge of shame that you would, you would have, you know, that you got compromised. That's not the case anymore. People get compromised and, it, and it's, it's an area of growth and it's an area where you can do better, but many companies would prefer to know that you've been compromised because then they can put systems in place. They can make sure, oh yes, I just got an email from you asking you to do something that was odd. And now I'll make sure I keep an eye on it. Or they put some things in place that will help them understand that, uh, you know, if they see anything abnormal from your account, they're, they're flagging. So it is no longer the case that you don't want to be uh, notifying vendors or you want to hold off. Uh, I, we always recommend you, you notify your vendors, you notify your clients, something, you know, this has happened. These are the steps we're putting in place. These are helping how, how we're securing your, your data. What about the, the culture that you have in place for your employees? I mean, I can imagine that, you know, a, an employee who finds themselves victim of this, they, in a lot of organizations, they might be hesitant to say anything or even report it because they're afraid that they'll get in trouble. Right. And that's where a top-down approach from, from the C-level executives on down that security is, is important for the organization. And not just that we're showing the world that we're secure, but internally, if we see something, we make sure that everybody uh, understands how it happened. There's not always a reason to blame somebody else that, that they clicked on a link or that they fell for a phishing, for a phishing scam. They happen. It happens all the time. It can get the best of us. What is important is that people understand that and, and executives understand that 
somebody might have gone to school for finance. They didn't go to school for understanding phishing emails and, and, and paying, uh, you know, really good attention to how they, you know, how they come out. That's IT's job. That's security's job. And it's not really the end user's fault necessarily that they, they got fished. And in many cases, security might have or, or could have done a better job teaching them what to look out for and maybe had better solutions in place. So I think that, you know, if somebody falls for a phishing scam, there shouldn't be blame put on the end user. There should be a, a, an understanding within the organization that there is areas of improvement and this is what we need to do. Where do you suppose we're headed here? Do, do you sense that uh, we're headed in a good direction or is this something that's going to be with us uh, for the time being, for, for the time to come? Uh, unfortunately, I think this is going to be with us for a, for a, a, a while to come because it's it's very much a, a whack-a-mole at this stage in, uh, of the game in that we're, we're, we're fixing one problem and, and the attackers solve it with another one. For example, uh, a lot of our clients now are putting in conditional access. So if you're logging in normally from, let's say, the U.S. to your email account and you suddenly log in from Finland, it's going to block you. Well, the attackers start to realize this, and then they will VPN and try to, you know, attack you from the U.S. It does stop some of the, the you know, some of the attackers because not all of them uh, are going to start switching around and, and attacking from different locations to see what works. But there is very much a cat and mouse game of uh, I'm, I'm putting this in place. They put something else in place. Uh, I do think that in the, in the long run, this is really an email type of communication problem. And email, when it was built, as we all know, was not secure. Joe, what do you think? All right, I want to open this with definitions again. And I want to say this again, and Chip gets it right here, Mm -hmm. uh, as one would expect he would. Business email compromise is not just someone impersonating a person from an outside email address. That's just impersonation. Right. Uh, You will frequently hear people call impersonation, simple impersonation, business email compromise. And this seems to me like when somebody goes, we were subjected to a sophisticated cyber attack (laughs) from an advanced actor. Uh, They don't want to say we uh, we fell victim to somebody sending a, an email from a newly created Gmail account. <laughs> they say we, we were victim of a business email compromise attack. Oh, those are very hard. And, uh, must have been a nation state actor. Right, must have been a nation state actor. <laughs> right. Uh, but that is incorrect. Uh, business email compromise is remarkably devastating because it involves the takeover of a bona fide business email account. And I really wish as a community we would insist on that term being used properly. Okay. Um, if, if executed properly, these things are very effective. Yeah. And that points to the first thing that Chip says is that there has been an exponential increase in these kind of attacks. There's been an exponential increase exactly because these things are remarkably effective. Yeah. They are, I call business email compromise the king of social engineering attacks. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's just my name for it because uh, I'm clever and I like to come up with cool <laughs> words. Uh, <laughs> it works so well and it bypasses so many controls that are in place. Uh, and with the advent of these suites like Microsoft 365 and Google Workplace, a successful business email compromise attack is so much more. Hmm. If I can get access to your Gmail account on a on a Google Work, Workplace, I have access to your documents. I have access to your chat records. I have access to everything. Right. It's almost the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. Same with Microsoft. I can impersonate you now, not only through your email, but also through Teams. And if you use uh, your email address to reset a Slack password, I can impersonate you through Slack. There's all kinds of things I can do. Right. Or God forbid, if you reuse your password for Slack. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Chip talks about training. And I think training is, uh, Chip is spot on here. The, the training needs to be consistent and, in, and engaging. And it needs to happen as frequently as possible. When I, that's what I mean when I say consistent. Mm. You want the event, the phishing event or the phone call event or the cha- even a simple changing of a password event, you want that event to be as close in time as possible to training. The best way to assure that is frequent training, mm-hmm. right? Because you never know when the attack is coming. So if you have frequent training, short, engaging training segments 
over the course of the year, then when that attack comes, somebody goes, wait, but we just saw this right. last week. Right, it's top of mind. Top of mind, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Making tra training relevant to an employee's financial situation may, may help bring it home, too. He talks about the W-2 attacks. Oh, right? yeah. He calls yeah. them. Um, I, not sure I like the like the term. I mean, yeah, filing a, a fake tax return is a, if somebody does that for you uh, and you're owed a refund by the IRS, that's a real problem. Uh, you're going to be months now getting your money. The IRS will make you whole. They mm -hmm. take care of the uh, the it's 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 a fraud problem for the government, not necessarily for you. Mm. Um, but they uh, they have to investigate it to make sure that you know that. You're being the you're the honest one. The fraud has occurred here, and you've got to prove to them now it wasn't me. Right. Um. So there's time with that. Same with getting your paycheck rerouted somewhere else. Yeah, that's probably a business problem. But there's going to be a couple of days where you were expecting a paycheck and you're not getting one. You don't have the money in your account. Mm -hmm. How is that going to impact you? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, you're going to get the money, but it's, th these things are going to be have real influence on your lives. Right. So right. I think. Your landlord and mortgage company may not be so forgiving. Right, right exactly. <laughs> uh, so I think saying that kind of helps the employee take ownership of it. I'm not saying that, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to screw the employee out of their money. And if, you, if you're going to do that, you shouldn't do that. That's terrible. Yeah. Don't do that. Uh, but it's going to take time. And sure. that time has real impact. Right. When someone is working on a business email compromise attack, they're going to craft specifically, or they can go through the process of crafting specifically tailored messages. Hmm. I, I don't think there's a spam filter in the world that's going to catch a specifically tailored message because it's going to be the first time this filter has ever seen this message, and it's going to look just like a normal message. There might be some things in there that are um, that are uh, a little bit telltale, but you know, maybe the links, maybe the URLs, maybe, maybe that is, but if, if I'm setting up a, a new attack, I'm going to have all these new indicators of compromise out there that haven't been seen before. Right. Uh, there, and I'm, if, if I'm an attacker, I'm going to rotate those with high frequency because they're cheap. Yeah, absolutely. So be mindful of that. My two recommendations, two things, policy and FIDO multi-factor authentication. When I say policy, think beyond your organization. Business email compromise at a vendor site or at a customer site or even an employee's uh, personal email compromise can have real impact on you. Hmm. Um, you know, if, if, if I compromise some, some employee's personal email account and then send in uh, an email and you look at it and go, yeah, that's right. This, this is the employee's personal email account that I have on file and I'm going to go ahead and change their banking records. Or they're, they're banking, you know, their direct deposit information right, for them, like right. they're asking here. Um, that's going to cost you. So your policy has to have, um, uh, has to have a check for that in place that involves something that isn't just an email back going, is this really you? Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> maybe a phone call. Mm -hmm. a phone call to a number on file, also verifying that the number on file hasn't been changed recently. That's another thing I want to talk about here because um, if I compromise someone's business account, I can go in there and change their, uh, their cell phone number. And that way, uh, if you call, the, uh, you call the office and the person that you're calling doesn't happen to be in there, and, I, and then you go in and you say, well, what's their cell phone number? I'll call their cell phone number. That calls the scammer, mm -hmm. right? Right. So- there should be some flag of indicating when that was changed and also a record of what the last one was. So, uh, you know, think about these things because they're going to be uh, real impacts when they come, when, when it happens. Because like I said, if they get access to the, to the sweet product, whatever it is, that's the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, but I really want to focus on the FIDO MFA. This is so cheap and so low friction when you compare it to how well it works. And and uh, spell it out here. What's FIDO? FIDO is Fast Identity Online. Okay. And we've talked about it before as YubiKeys, right? Right, right. So a YubiKey is like 45 bucks. But I looked this up today, Dave. You know that Adafruit sells a FIDO key for $10? Wow. $10. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend the Adafruit version. I don't know what the, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I would, I'm not, not recommending it. <laughs> you just have no experience. I just have it. no experience with it. Yeah, and uh, it's an open source software platform. And uh, while I am a big fan of Adafruit and uh, everything that goes on there, um, I don't know that I would rely on that as an enterprise solution. 
Yeah. Uh, remember when you're ever going to, when you're going to equip people with these, equip them with two and tell them to sign up for all their accounts with both keys and keep one safe. Right. Uh, that's a big part of how this works. Um, Chip thinks that this is going to be a long-term problem, and I agree. And the biggest problem is that companies are not using things like YubiKeys. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest problem. You change that, uh, you you enact that policy, and it stops like almost 100% of these attacks. That's what I was going to say. I remember, I I don't know, it could have been a year ago now, you and I did a story about uh, Google had put out a bunch of statistics from their own studies. I think it was their own internal use. Right, and the Titan key. And basically, right, if, if if you're using a hardware key like this, it just stops it. Like, right. they had no problem. Right. No, nobody got through this. Yep. You know, it, it wasn't like 90%. No, it was 100%. Right, you it, know? it works. There <laughs> yeah. are still ways to get around it, but now what you have to do is you have to break into the network, you have to do ARP spoofing, and you have to capture session tokens yeah, right. you're no longer the low hanging. Yeah, fruit. you're no longer now. You're now somebody is required to have actual mad hacking skills to 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 get into your email account. Right, right. All right. Well, uh, again, our thanks to Chip Gibbons for joining us. We do appreciate him sharing his time and expertise. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to Harbor Labs and the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at harborlabs.com and isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.